ladies that are involved that, that participate in uh, worship teams mm -hmm. to go because you learn so much about He's going to have to do a different one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, well, I want to welcome everybody to class this morning. And I uh, want to encourage you to go ahead and position yourself wherever you can see the PowerPoint best. <laughs> If you were not here yesterday, I want to make sure that uh, you uh, take a look at any of this material here on these chairs. Uh, you're welcome to any of this. All that material is free, including this uh, booklet that my ministry makes available to uh, anybody. Uh, it's how can I help myself and others in times of grief? And those are uh, available free. All of this material here is uh, free. And uh, let me tell you how much I appreciate you uh, being here. Yesterday, we mentioned about how that, you know, this is not a positive, pleasant subject to talk about. Uh, we human beings have a, have a bad habit of avoiding things that are difficult and things that uh, make us feel uncomfortable. Uh, we, um, I'm convinced, in our culture, what we have done here recently is in recent years, we have created a god. We've created an idol. And that idol is our comfort zone. Uh, people talk about, well, I can't do that. That's out of my comfort zone. The cross is not a symbol of comfort. It's a symbol of crucifixion. Crucifixion is about suffering. I think one of the most unhealthy uh, attitudes that we Christians can cultivate is living within our comfort zone. It greatly lessens our ability to glorify God by helping other people. I really appreciate the fact that uh, you have come to expose yourself to talking about, thinking out loud together about some things that may be pretty, uh, pretty difficult. Uh, when you talk about loss and the effect of loss in a person's life, you're talking about something that uh, we struggle with, something that involves pain, something that involves uh, questions that we become very frustrated with, and we can't find the answers to, and so we have to live without the answers, and that creates a lot of uh, drama in our life internally. Uh, this is just a tough subject, and for anybody to expose themselves to a tough subject, I, I just think that person needs to be commended. Consider yourself this morning commended, because I think it's uh, awesome that you've made the choice to be here in this class. I want you to leave with the, not now, uh, <laughs> but I want you to leave with a feeling of, you know what, I'm, um, I'm better prepared. Um, I know a little bit more, and I'm a little bit better prepared for my living with loss, and then also helping other people live with their losses. So I have a ministry called Widowhood Workshop. It's not just about uh, the widowed, but uh, it's about living with loss. It's about educating people in regard to loss and the impact of loss and about helping to give direction and encouragement to people who've experienced loss to help them to learn to live with the reality of their loss. Uh, I have a book here in my hand uh, that's very interesting. It is called How to Go on Living When Someone You Love Dies. How to Go on Living. That title really describes the struggle that we human beings have when we suffer loss. I mean loss of something really precious and important and valuable to us. To go on living is a choice. Now, we're going to go on existing, but to go on living is a choice. One of the three mottos of my ministry is don't die until you're dead. <laughs> Whenever we suffer the loss of somebody by death, we can feel like we want to die. We can ourselves feel dead. Now, our heart's still beating. The blood's still coursing through our veins, but we just don't feel like we used to feel. Our life's been turned upside down, or our life has just imploded or exploded, and we just are really struggling because we've lost something extremely valuable. The choice to live after loss is a choice that an individual has to make, and nobody can make that choice 
for them. We can have help with it, but we have to make that choice for ourselves. My wife died on Christmas morning of 2013 at 9.40 in the morning. She suffered for eight and a half years with Parkinson's disease. She declined really quickly for a Parkinson's patient. Most Parkinson's patients will live 20 plus, 30 plus years, and they don't die of Parkinson's, they die of something else. But my wife only lasted eight and a half years. Her decline was really fast, and Parkinson's did take her life. In July of 2013, I was standing out in the hallway with a doctor in the hospital, and he said, look, you're not dealing with an emergency situation here, but he said, what's gonna happen? And he said, it's gonna be sooner rather than later, but it's not going to be quick. He said, what's gonna happen is that Parkinson's disease is going to get up into her respiratory system, and she's just gonna quit breathing. And sure enough, at 9.40 in the morning, on Christmas day of 2013, that's what happened. She just quit breathing. After my wife died, I uh, started looking for help. I called the hospital that provided the hospice care. It was a Catholic hospital. And I wanted to get in a support group. And I inquired about that, but they wouldn't let me in because I didn't qualify. And that was frustrating. I didn't understand why they had this policy, but the reason why I didn't qualify was this. They said, you have to be past your loss 90 days. Oh. I'm thinking to myself, I'm dying inside. I desperately need help. And you're telling me I don't qualify to be in a support group. And that was a pretty rough fact to have to deal with. Well, now I know why they have that policy. If I would have gotten into that support group, I probably wouldn't have learned much because I was in such a pitiful state at that point in time. I was just in the I gotta just keep breathing stage. And when you're in that kind of stage, it's hard to be receptive to things that may be of value to you. And it's certainly hard for you to be of any value to other people. So that's why they have this requirement about being past your loss about 90 days. And I got in that support group and it was a great help. Then I started looking for uh, help on the uh, internet, especially for widowed people. And you know what I found in regard to help for widowed people? Virtually nothing. And I thought, whoa, I was a mess. In the middle of January of 2014 in Northeastern Ohio, it's a cold, blustery night in an empty house. Nobody else was there. I had an experience I've never had before that and never had since then. I just blurted something out. You know how kids have no filter between their brain and their lips and stuff just comes out? Okay, that's the way I was that night. And here's what I said out loud. Why in the world I said it out loud, I don't know. But I said, what's wrong with me? What is wrong with me? Uh, that's how big of a mess I was. And that's what prompted me to go searching for help, especially help for widowed people. Uh, the loss of a spouse is unique. All losses are unique. But the loss of a spouse is especially unique because of the nature of the marriage relationship. And that's when uh, I decided that somebody ought to do something to start a ministry in the Lord's church to help churches and help communities become educated about life after loss. As bad as loss is, and it bites. Man, it bites. Living with the loss is harder. Loss is hard. Living with the loss is harder. That's why I appreciate the title of this book, How to Go on Living, not just existing, how to go on living when someone you love dies. Well, can I ask a question? Yes, sir. And please, this is a relaxed atmosphere. Do that anytime. Yes, sir. What you're speaking about applied to living with loss while that that lost person that you have lost the relationship is still alive. Say, say a son that has decided to abandon God. We talked about yesterday about how loss, when we think about loss, typically we think about the loss of people by death. But the reality is we grieve a lot of losses. It could be like the loss of your identity that was developed by virtue of the fact you were in the military or you had a certain occupation and then you lost it. You've lost your identity. 
a person who gets a cancer diagnosis has lost their health. What are people gonna do? They're gonna grieve when they lose something of value. When we lose a child or a grandchild to the devil, to the world, it's an agonizing loss. Now we hope to be able to reclaim them, but that's not within our control. Like we talked about yesterday, there's a whole lot more out of our control than in our control. And we have sometimes losses that we sustain divorce is the loss of a marriage, the loss of all the hopes and the dreams and the intents of that person when they said, I do. People lose parts of their body. They become amputees. They grieve. They have to learn to live with the loss of their body part. There are all kinds of losses that we experience in our life. And what we need to learn is the impact of loss and how to deal with that. The impact of the loss we call grief. But how do you deal with that? Well, you got to become educated about it. So that's what this class is all about. That's a, that's a great uh, question. We're going to grieve about a lot of things in our life. You cannot go from this life to eternity without experiencing loss. It's just not possible to live without loss. It's inevitable. You're going to experience a number of different kinds of losses before you die. Yes, Keith. Um, after your wife passed, did you find out about parents without partners? No. You didn't? No. I, I have heard of that organization. Yeah. But again, I, I appreciate the fact that there are some of these services that in our culture we've created because we recognize the need of people. You know, when you stop and think about Al-Anon, for instance, the people who are in Al-Anon, what have they lost? They've lost somebody to alcoholism, somebody in their family to alcoholism, and they're struggling with that. They're grieving the loss of their loved one, their family member, to a horrible, horrible life of alcoholism. So there's a lot of losses that we need to recognize in our life to help us and to help us help other people. Uh, we're gonna do a real quick review of what we talked about uh, yesterday. We did not get all the way through this PowerPoint. Uh, this PowerPoint is uh, helpful because you get a little bit of a visual perspective as well as an audible one. We talked about hopelessness and what a tremendous effect that hopelessness has in a person's life. And we talked about how hopelessness is a feeling. It's a feeling we have. Now, it's a feeling we have because we have circumstances in our life. We have both a thinker and a feeler. And our thinker is what we ought to be guided by, but that's not always what we are guided by. What happens is a lot of times our feeler gets to running so fast on overdrive that it overwhelms our thinker. And so what we do is we feel our way through a difficult life circumstance. What often happens when that feeler runs real fast in a difficult life circumstance is we begin to feel like things are hopeless. Hopelessness is a feeling. And that feeling has a tremendous effect on us. We struggle mentally, we struggle emotionally, we struggle psychologically, and most importantly, we may very well struggle spiritually. People who suffer severe loss are also people who often struggle with their concept and relationship with God. The million dollar question, people think, the million dollar question is why? Sometimes people say, why has God done this to me? Other people say, why has God allowed me to experience this? Why is this happening to me? Let me suggest to you that part of our problem is we focus on the wrong question. I realize our obsession with the question why. Let me tell you what's the real million dollar question. Who? Who loves me more than anybody else? Who knows me better than anybody else? Who can provide for me better than anybody else? What loss ought to do when we're thinking right, what loss ought to do, it ought to cause us to have a greater passion for intimacy with God than we've ever had before because we sense our tremendous need. We need help. We're struggling. Loss has a tremendous impact in our life to such an extent that we can feel hopeless even when we are not hopeless. But 
we can feel that way, even though we're not hopeless. There are hope stealers in life. There are things that happen and things that we experience that cause us to feel hopeless. Emotions are not something we should rely on. Uh, Dr. James Dobson has this observation, and I think it's so true. Emotions are biased, whimsical, unreliable. They lie as often as they tell the truth. We must understand that emotions are unreliable and at times tyrannical. Boy, that is so true. We are mental. We are also emotional. We need to be guided by our thinking. But despite the fact that we ought to be, it's not always the way that we are. Sometimes our emotions just get the best of us. That's why, stop and think about this. A young lady who grew up in the church, uh, loves the Lord, just is very involved in the ministry of the church. She has this boyfriend, and in the heat of passion, she loses her virginity, her feelings have driven her to the extent that she's crossed the line and she's lost her virginity. Now, do you think that that godly young lady who's made that terrible decision in the heat of passion, do you think she's going to grieve? She's going to have to live with that loss and the circumstances of that loss the rest of her life. Now, she can let that end her life, you know, a real decent, meaningful life. And that's what happens with some people. Some people have these losses that they experience, it becomes such an emotional thing to them that actually from that point forward, all they do is exist. They don't live. And a lot of that has to do with the overwhelming experience of being so emotional because of the loss. And this is the way you feel. You feel as if you are drowning. Job was a great man. And this is where we ended yesterday. Nobody questions the integrity of that man. There's a reason why. God even said there was nobody like him. God's the one that said that he was he was blameless, that he feared God. Here was a good man, a great man. And look at what he said. My days are swifter than a weaver shuttle. Now look at this. This is what impressed me. I don't know how many times I've read this book, and I did not see the latter part of this verse. This great man of faith said that in regard to his days, they are spent without hope. That's the effect of loss, even on a great man of God. Did he have hope? Now, he had lost 10 children. He lost all of his prosperity, his cattle, his critters. He had lost his health. He lost the support of his wife. Did he have hope, though? Did he have a God in heaven? who loved him, a God who's described as the God of all hope. He had a God in heaven who knew about what was going on in his life, a God in heaven who loved him, a God in heaven who was protecting him from things that he could not handle. You know, God was drawing the lines and it was forcing Satan to color inside the lines. Satan wanted things done. God said, okay, but this is where you stop. Don't you dare touch him. And then with that second phase of suffering, he said, okay, you go ahead and touch him, but don't you dare take his life. See, God was protecting Job because God loved Job, and God had a relationship with Job. Job had God, and yet that great man of God, in a sense of hopelessness, said his days were without hope. See, he felt that way. That wasn't true, but that's how he felt. By the way, when we're working with people who've suffered loss and are really overwhelmed with hopelessness, and need to find hope, one thing that we need to help them to understand is that there is a difference between feeling like there's no hope and having no hope. There is a big difference. There is hopelessness. At that time, you were without Christ. And the Bible says, having no hope. Yeah, there is life without hope. And that life without hope is without whom? God. Without God. When a person doesn't have God, they don't have hope. God is always available. But if we don't access his availability, if we don't seek and cultivate a relationship with him, 
We don't have hope. If we have God in our life, we always have hope. We may not be feeling it, but we always have hope. And we have to constantly have our thinker remind our feeler. I'm sure you're familiar with this passage from 1 Thessalonians 4, where Paul was trying his dead level best by the inspiration of God to help these people who were struggling with the fact that they had lost their loved ones. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. He didn't chew them out for sorrowing, for grieving. He said there's a difference between sorrowing and sorrowing like you have no hope. See, people who are Christians, devout Christians, who walk closely with the Lord, when we lose people and things this side of eternity, we are going to struggle because we're human beings. We're not machines. You know, we're not a car engine. We're not a laptop. We're human beings. We have a feeler as well as a thinker, and we are going to struggle mightily when we've lost something of great value. Go ahead and grieve, but don't grieve as if you have no hope because you have hope. We all have hope if we have God. What we've got to do is fight the feeling. Fight that feeling of hopelessness. Hopelessness can dominate us. Remember that observation of James Dobson? They can be tyrannical. Feelings, emotions can be tyrannical. They can not only get in you and raise your emotion, they can dominate you. We've got to be able to control that and fight that. The way to do that is to cultivate self-control. There is a reason why there's such an emphasis on self-control. In the fruit of the Spirit, in Galatians chapter 5, there's self-control. In the Christian graces, in 2 Peter chapter 1, there is self-control. We've got to take charge of our emotions. I love this very strong, passionate passage. What we need to be doing is bringing every thought into captivity, every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We just cannot let our emotions get the best of us. When we are overwhelmed in our emotions, and whether it's a positive or a negative emotion, we often don't make wise decisions. I, a lot of times in spring, have concerns about kids who are graduating from high school. They're in a very celebratory mood. What do you do when you're on a high high? Sometimes you do dumb stuff. You don't focus on what's really important. Your, your judgment isn't quite as good. For a number of years, I worked with a local public school system in Southeast Ohio, in Northeast Ohio. I worked with a public school system on the Drug Advisory Council and with some other things with the public school system. And I was involved in uh, some planning things that were done in regard to the end of school. And one of the things uh, that became a great concern was during uh, what's typically viewed as prom time, there were uh, raised concerns about alcohol, uh, other drugs, about hotel rooms. <clears throat> they are on a high high. They're at an awesome time in their life. They are loving the idea that they're not gonna have to go to school anymore. And when people celebrate, Sometimes things get out of hand. I think one of the dumbest things about our culture, I'm a great, I, I love sports. Uh, sports is a diversion to me. And I love the fact that when I get engaged in watching sports or talking about sports, there isn't anybody in the hospital. There's nobody dying. And it's just a really neat diversion that's meaningless. The sad fact is I've got to go back to real life eventually. But, you know, there is a uh, championship one. So the kids on the college campus get sofas out of the fraternity and they get a bunch of other stuff together on the street and they burn it. I mean, how stupid is that to celebrate a tremendous achievement by becoming involved in all that kind of uh, violence and destruction? See, that's why we've got to exercise self-control. When we're having a high high or a very low low, we've got to be very careful to take charge of what's going on inside of us. 
As I mentioned, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5 lists, among other things, a part of that fruit of the Spirit, self-control. The Christian graces do the same thing. They list among the qualities that ought to grace our lives, the quality of self-control. Now, self-control involves two things. Often when we think of self-control, we think of restraint. But don't think of self-control as merely restraint. It has to do with restraint and motivation. It takes self-control sometimes to get up out of bed. You gotta motivate yourself to get up out of bed. Like today? Like today? <laughs> Man, you should have come out with me this morning. I walked 1.6 miles this morning after I got up out of bed. You should have come with me. Yeah. Oh, I, uh, you know, there are some things that are just really difficult to motivate ourselves to do when we have certain life circumstances. There are also things that we need to be careful to restrain ourselves from when we're experiencing a lot of emotions or difficult circumstances. Yes, ma'am. She has a question. Yes. So, uh, to, to mention, um, um, the previous slide where I said about your, um, turning your emotions. So, um, I've been working for myself, you know, working through loss of you know, how to, like, yesterday, how to pit out forward and how to make that, you know, mm -hmm. how to help others. So, I'm, I just want to tell you, thank you for doing this because rather than you say, okay, God, am I on the right path? You know, how do I turn what I've, you know, gone through into help somebody else? And so, for myself, just the emotional piece. So I wanted to tap into being a veteran and being a mom, you know, and, and you know the loss of you know military stuff, the loss of my marriage, and so what I what I, I'm working on is I wanted to develop a place where veterans and moms that were together can come, and so direct to emotions. So um, you know, you have like a ministry or company, and it's called Wellness Mom Solutions, and the tagline for that is engage your emotions, and then mm. for the veterans, it's veteran wellness. And it's healing from within. And the Drew Wellness Mom is Journey of Healing. And I just wanted to tell you, you just gave me the answer. Because I was like, Lord, am I on the right path? Is that something I should be doing? Just when you mentioned, when your wife died, there was nothing. There wasn't anything. I looked around. With veterans, there's veteran mental, you know, you know mental health issues. Everyone has on different levels, not just veterans. Mm -hmm. But for me, I'm like you. There's not really anything besides the VA, which gets a bad rap. But I'm like, how can I tap into it? So I really just wanted to say thank you and to God for, I've been like, am I on the right path? Should I be doing this kind of thing? But I have this in my heart, like, this needs to be done. I just want to tell you, thank you for just really giving me the motivation to really, you know, like public speak and just, you know, hear what I've gone through and how can I help and I teach classes like that. So when you uh, choose to take your losses and transform them into gains, you're gaining a ministry, you're initiating a ministry, so you're gaining a ministry, and you are also turning your losses into a gain for other people, because you wanna bless other people, you wanna help other people. One of the weird things about loss, but one of the great things about loss, is the losses that we sustain in our life, through them we gain, I know that sounds weird, through the losses we sustain, sustain in our life, we gain opportunities for ministry. We gain opportunities for growth. We gain wisdom by virtue of our losses. You know, since my uh, wife has passed away, I see a lot of things much more clearly. My values are very, very definitive now. They are much, my convictions, much stronger. One of the things that loss will do to you, if you really work hard at recovering from your loss and trying to heal, one of the things that will come from your losses is you'll find a lot of gains, you'll find a lot of blessings. But again, that has to do with you taking charge of what's going on inside of you, you know, your thinker and your feeler, and making it a point to use what has been experienced for the glory of God by helping others and promoting your own growth. Yes, sir. Uh I, I've had a few losses, you know. I did you come when I had the motorcycle when I was in a wheelchair? No. Well, you had a motorcycle accident, and, motorcycle. and you were in a wheelchair. I was in a wheelchair. Yeah, you came and saw. Anyway, uh, the uh, I had that, and then after that, uh, had a fire, lost everything. 
And then after that, I had we had a car wreck. I, a Hiawatha actually came to the funeral. Oh, oh really? Of my mother. Yeah. We flipped on the highway, broke my neck, and um, uh, uh, my mother was killed in the car wreck. Uh, came back to Seattle. Uh, the church actually took very good care of care of us when we, when we came back. There's other problems later on, but uh, uh, maybe because of that. But uh, uh, there's a difference when Paul is talking about self-control because a lot of people uh, get through this stuff with psychology. Mm -hmm. But what Paul is talking about, because he was shipwrecked, he, uh, he uh, was beaten over and over again and all these different things. But what, when he talks about go through trials, he talks with authority because, like you're saying, now he can teach us. He's not he's not mm -hmm. sitting in a suit <laughs> from a oh yeah of theories, and it's it, he's gone through it. Yeah, I mean he's gone through the middle. He's gone through false brethren. Mm -hmm. He's gone through the beatings. He's gone through all the turmoil of uh, the shipwreck, uh, floating mm -hmm. up the shore where he's going to go preach. And then even after, when he doesn't get to his destination, he, anyway, so. Authority by virtue of loss. Yeah. But authority I, to speak effectively. I see a lot of football players with tremendous self-control, but they don't have the self-control that's from God. Yes. It's not God's self-control. It's not, and that comes from being filled with the Holy Spirit. And then the fruit of that is self-control. The fruit of that is yeah. love. Tomorrow, so, we're going to talk about um, an incident that Paul experienced in Acts 27 that's really interesting about this hopelessness. You know, there are some hopeless life, apparently hopeless life circumstances. Well, yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. That you can have hope because of God. It yes. gets to the point you just can't do it without God coming in. Yeah. You know? And he got to that point. He says, I can't do this anymore. I cannot. I'm despairing of life itself. Mm -hmm. But God came in there. I made something great. So the greatest need of every person who's had loss is God. Greater intimacy with God. That is the number one thing that any person needs after they've suffered loss. But we live in a an unbelieving culture in an agnostic culture. So it's hard to sell that concept. But we in the church ought to represent that concept. We ought to be the ones who represent the Lord and prove to people by virtue of our faith that this is how you handle loss. This is how you deal effectively with hopelessness. Yes, sir. You know, before you get away from this subject, take charge of your emotions and bringing every thought. To me, thoughts and emotions are different. Mm -hmm. um, I realize that as I change my thoughts, maybe I can <coughs> change my emotions. Mm -hmm. But um, years ago, I mean, I've been, we've been married 44 years. We only been married six months, and we went to a marriage encounter. I don't know if you remember those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we were taught during those that feelings aren't right or wrong. They just are. They just are. Yeah. You know, and, some, and sometimes a person will come up to me and say, well, Dave, you shouldn't feel that way. <laughs> and I just want to go, oh, yeah, you're right. I should, I'll stop feeling yeah. right. You can't do that. Yeah. You can't Please. stop feeling right. yeah. You feel what you feel. Exactly. And sometimes I think when we tell people you shouldn't feel that way, uh, you're kicking them while they're down. You know? I appreciate you mentioning that. One of the things that I really encourage with um, my ministry about educating people about life after loss is what you've got to do is embrace your grief. Not deny it, you know, not ignore it, but embrace it. And deeply grieve as long as you need to. And don't let anybody take that away from you. Doug Manning wrote a book called Don't Take My Grief Away. Great philosophy. Whenever you've experienced loss, you need to grieve. You need to fully embrace all of those emotions and live within the framework of all those emotions. Eventually, though, what you have to do is get to the point where you get back to mentally being guided by what you know is true. Because emotions are not, are not always consistent with reality. Uh, emotions sometimes are inconsistent. And there is a difference between thoughts and emotions. You know the way to... Uh, change your emotions and change your thinking 
a lot of times people think that what you need to do is feel yourself into a better way of acting and a better way, way of thinking. It's the other way around. We need to act ourselves into a better way of thinking and act ourselves into a better way of feeling. That's one reason why I mentioned about my walking. That's one reason I walk. I Well, one reason I walk is so I figure if I burn calories, I can eat calories. And I don't want to change my eating habits. So that's one reason I walk. Another reason I walk is because of the mental and emotional therapy it is. It is very therapeutic for me to get out there and walk. Now, a lot of times when I begin that uh, adventure in the morning, I don't really like it. You know, I might have to go a half a mile or maybe a mile before I can embrace this and say, you know, hey, I'm feeling better. But it is a, a struggle sometimes because, again, we're human beings. We've got this thinker and this feeler, and they're difficult to deal with. Life's a challenge. Life's a struggle. Now, um, we always have hope, no matter what our circumstances are, no matter how you feel. If we're Christians, we always have hope. Now, may the God of hope. Now, notice how he's described, the God of hope. If you have God, you have hope. Because he's the God of hope. Now, you may not feel that way, but that doesn't change this fact. See, this is a reality. This is true. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Abound in hope. That is what we ought to strive for, is to abound in hope. Now, notice the connection between faith and hope. Notice what he says here. That the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. There are times when our circumstances are so stressful and so overwhelming, so hopeless, we think, that it is very hard for us to believe. There are times that our lives, if we're honest, represent that father who brought the demon-possessed son to Jesus. And Jesus asked him if he believed. He said, Lord, I believe. Help my what? Unbelief. It's okay to admit the fact that you're struggling spiritually. The first step toward getting to a better place spiritually is to admit that you need to get to a better place because you're not in a good place now. Yes, ma'am. I think one of the problems we have is just people on the planet. <laughs> and there's 8.7 billion of us on this planet. That's, the that's a lot of problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the problem. But instead of blaming God, realize he does allow things to occur but he has hope in us that we will stay on that narrow path and he allows Satan to do whatever Satan's done and do to us with a hedge of protection around us. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things I especially try to tell young folks is when you're blaming God, is that really the person you should be blaming? Mm -hmm. You know, we just went on a, almost a month road trip and I told my son, I said, if we die on um, this trip, would I want you to blame God because I'm not? He goes, no, that's stupid. So I, I feel good. You've about raised a good that. son. <laughs> I, I feel good in the fact that he knows that life happens. Mm -hmm. and, and because life happens, that's not God's fault. It's choices that everybody makes. Mm -hmm. Anything we do is a choice. Yeah. A choice to do or a choice to not do. I don't have to do it because I am genetically made. No. Mm -hmm. I might have something that drives me a little harder than somebody else, yeah. but I still have to make the choice. Amen, sister. You got that exactly right. You know. Let me give you a life perspective that I think is uh, it can be very uh, soundly defended in scripture. Not everything that happens in this world is God's will. But in everything that happens, God has a will. Now, let me explain to you what I mean by that. Not everything that happens in this world is what God wants to happen. Do you think God wanted Eve to be deceived and eat the forbidden fruit? Do you think he wanted that blockhead husband of hers? You know, he wasn't deceived. He knew what he was doing. 
First Timothy chapter two. Yeah. Eve was deceived. He was not deceived. He knew what he was doing. That doesn't speak well of the male gender. <laughs> but you know, do you think God wanted all that degradation, that spiritual degradation, to occur that prompted the flood? You know, do you think God wants domestic violence in our homes? Do you think God wants people that struggle with uh, their mental health issues? Not everything that happens in this world is God's will. In, the, in other words, what he wants to happen. But in everything that happens, God has a will. You know what God's will is? That he be glorified and that we be a blessing to others. That's always true, no matter what happens, in sickness and in health. You know, we talk about that in marriage. Let's talk about that in life, in sickness and in health, in poverty or in affluence. What God wants is for him to be glorified and for us to be a blessing to others. That's always his purpose. That's always his intent. That's always his design. He always has a purpose in everything. Whether, you know, we need to affix that purpose though. We need to say, okay, I've, I've lost a limb because of this traffic accident. You gotta make a choice then at that point with that loss, that horrific loss. You've gotta make a choice then. How can I glorify God and be a blessing to others in light of what's happened to me? And that's true in adversity and prosperity. We need to always be thinking, how can I use this to glorify God and be a blessing to other people? In uh, the book of Colossians, Paul writes this, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Notice, now notice these passages here. Where's our hope? Where does it say our hope is? It's in heaven. Okay, then he talks about it later on in that chapter. He talks about not being moved away from the hope of the what? The gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ. Then look later on in that chapter. Christ in you is the hope of glory. A Christian's hope has to do with things that are eternal, things that are spiritual. We always have hope because our hope is not about the circumstances of life. Our hope is about things eternal, things in the unseen world, things that are spiritual. Yes, sir. I wanted to mention, what, and I, I know I'm not disagreeing with you, but I what's not in the Bible with the Apostle Paul is his recovery time because I'm sure mm -hmm. that after getting beaten terribly he didn't jump up and preach you know start preaching and you know or say <laughs> yay I'm <laughs> so glad I suffered yeah, yeah. he did he, 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 he and somebody was, and also he was willing I believe to receive help oh yes he wouldn't say no nobody helped me out and he know. talks about that he yeah. thanks when he writes his letters he often thanks people who have been of service to him who have been a supportive of him right but we always have hope but our hope is a spiritual hope it's centered on the unseen it's centered on the things that are eternal so we always have hope no matter how we feel and no matter what our circumstances are finding hope that's the hard part is finding hope when we've lost it the value of hope is this hope motivates and hope inspires that's the value of hope that's why a sense of hopelessness is so serious and so important. It's so valuable to have hope. If we don't have hope, we're not going to have that inspiration and that motivation to keep on going. Now, there's a common hope and an uncommon hope. And I'm going to quickly address this difference. Yesterday, in one of the, uh, uh, the sessions, there was a uh, talk about biblical hope and worldly hope. Now that's different words. I'm using this wording to distinguish common hope and uncommon hope. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. The Bible sometimes talks about common hope. Common hope is about what the speaker yesterday would have called worldly hope. Herod, for instance, was hoping to see a miracle. He was hoping to see a miracle. Did he see a miracle? He did not see a miracle, but he was hoping to see a miracle. Uh, Felix uh, bribed the apostle Paul in hope of it being beneficial to him, but it wasn't. 
But the reason for the bribe, it was prompted by hope. Paul talks about a hope to visit shortly. See, sometimes we have hopes about things that are of a natural nature, uh, a circumstantial nature, a worldly nature. People, why do people buy lottery tickets? They hope. By the way, have you ever flipped? The, I need to find, I just refuse to buy a lottery ticket. The next time I see one laying on the ground, I'm going to pick it up because I know what it says on the flip side. It gives you the mathematical statistics mm -hmm. about the possibility of you winning the lottery. There ain't much chance. But people buy those tickets in hope. See, there's a lot of things that we hope for. What does a young lady often dream about and hope for in her late teens and in her 20s? She hopes to get married. Um, she hopes to meet um, a great guy. Do all those young ladies have that hope fulfilled? Sometimes they end up getting married, but to the wrong guy, and it ends up becoming a disaster. But see, we have these hopes, and it's just natural. And it's because we have these hopes, we're driven to do certain things. You know, if you, if you have this hope of getting married, then you've got to do things to make that happen. You've got to have the motivation and the inspiration to make things happen. You've got to get yourself out there. I guess is one way to put it. But see, those are common hopes. Those are what I would call common hopes. Now, there's a, nip, a different kind of a hope. There is a hope that is uncommon. That's the hope that we as Christians have. This hope that we have uh, is mentioned a lot of times in the Bible. The word hope, uh, generally speaking, both the common and the uncommon, it's found 85 times in the Gospels. Now watch this, by the way. 85 times in the Gospels. Uh, 85 times total. Yeah, in the Gospels, five times. In the book of Acts, 10 times. In the letters in the New Testament, 70 times. What does that tell you? I find that really interesting. Why would there be five in the Gospels, 10 in the book of Acts, Set the vast overwhelming number of them are in the letters. Keep well in the gospels, Christ was with them on earth, but in the letters, he was back in heaven. Yeah, he was their hope and he was there with them, and he was teaching and preaching and, and working miracles. Now, in the letters, you got letters written to Christians. Now, a lot of these Christians were really struggling with the pushback and even severe persecution. What did they need? They needed hope. And so there's a real emphasis in the letters of the New Testament on the hope that we have as Christians. The uncommon use indicates a confident expectation. A confident, not just a hope, not just a wish or a desire. See, the, the common uh, word is um, about a wish or a desire. The uncommon use of the idea of hope in the Bible has to do with things spiritual, things eternal, things that cannot be taken away because of anything we experience in this life. See, our hope, our hope isn't in our circumstances. Our hope is in God. Uh, I love the Psalms. Uh, they're so personal and so practical and so devotional in nature. Hope in the Lord, Psalm 31. Psalm 39, my hope is in you. Psalm 42 and 43, hope in God. Psalm 119, you have caused me to hope. Psalm 130, O Israel, hope in the Lord. See where our hope is? Our hope isn't in getting healed, getting better when we get sick. That is a common hope. That's our desire. That's our wish. But even if we never get better, and if we die because of that physical affliction, see, the uncommon hope cannot be taken away from us, no matter what the condition of our physical body is. Now, that doesn't mean that we aren't going to experience days where we're going to struggle with hopeless feelings. But there's a difference between hopeless feelings and the reality of being without hope. When we are Christians, we are never 
forever without hope. Because our hope cannot be stolen, this uncommon, spiritual, eternal kind of hope cannot be stolen by horrific, <clears throat> terrible, ugly, painful life circumstances. We've got to get that deeply embedded in our brain, deeply embedded in our feeler, so that we can really live a more confident life despite the struggles that we're going to experience. Isn't it interesting that when the Bible talks about suffering, that often when it talks about suffering, there's a reference to a value in that suffering. Of all things, a value in the suffering. Let me read to you this passage in Romans chapter 5, because I think it's a really powerful reminder of what good, and sometimes we ask, you know, what, what good is going to come from this? Well, do you know where the answer to that question is? The answer to that question is in our choices. Whether or not suffering, loss, is of value to us is up to us. It has to do with our choices. And Romans chapter 5 starts this way. Therefore, having been justified by, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but also we also glory in tribulations. Now, is that weird or what? He says we glory in tribulation. Why? Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, stick to uh, endurance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint. See, there's a connection between suffering and actually having a hope. I set my alarm to remind me about what time I needed to start wrapping up. <laughs> so <clears throat> there is value in suffering if we decide to seek the value. Now, people can experience loss, and it can crush them, ruin their life, the rest of the days they exist. Another person could experience the same kind or similar kind of loss, and it end up causing them to be stronger as a Christian than they've ever been before. With better values, a more clear perspective, and a closer walk with the Lord. You know, there is value in desperation. When we have that overwhelming feeling of hopelessness, that can actually be a blessing if we see that in those hopeless feelings, what we need most of all is a relationship with the Lord, a closer walk with the Lord. How bad is something if it causes you to seek a closer relationship with God? How bad is something if it prompts you to seek a closer relationship with God? After my wife passed away, I prayed differently than when I had my wife with me. I prayed more passionately. I struggle with saying some things in prayer. For several months, I tried to verbalize my gratitude for 41 years with my wife, and I couldn't do it. I couldn't get the words out. I would break down every time. I kept trying, and I kept trying, and I kept trying. I can say it now. I can pray it now, and I do pray it now occasionally. I've lost my wife. Can you be thankful for what you no longer have, for what you lost? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can. It takes time and it takes a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. But with effort in that relationship with the Lord, it helps us to see things more clearly, to see our need for Him more clearly, and to want a closer walk with Him more than we ever have before. And that's what I tried to do after uh, my wife passed away, is I tried to spend several months more passionately seeking the Lord than I ever had in my life. And that's what we need most of all, is we need that close walk with the Lord if we're going to live after we've suffered loss. There is hope. There is always hope. No matter how we feel, there is always hope. Indeed, hope is simply faith directed to the future. 
I don't know how many of the other classes that you've been able to be a, a part of, but that concept has been mentioned. Yesterday, especially with Mark Jameson, I remember him talking about this very thing when he was talking about Hebrews chapter 11. I don't remember if it was in earlier in the day or last night, but that really is what hope is. Hope is faith directed to the future. Do you have hope? If you have God, you have hope. No matter what you're living with, no matter what you may experience in your future, because you have God, you always have hope. Uh, comment, question, observation? Yeah, Keith. What does the ISBE stand for? Oh, I, that's a personal note of mine. Uh, that is uh, International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. Oh. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, <laughs> that is a great uh, dictionary to use for people who like to do deep study about a lot of different biblical things.